93% of your life is spent indoors, but so many of our favorite moments are outdoors. The fresh air, the feeling of peace. Since warmer weather is almost here, let's make the most of it with Outer, the new outdoor furniture company with purposely designed furniture to get you outdoors more. Outer makes the world's most beautiful, comfortable, innovative, and high-quality outdoor furniture, all from sustainable materials. I love the new outdoor dining table and chairs I just bought. It looks great in my backyard, and it's the perfect setup for hosting a dinner party. Go to liveouter.com slash the founder hour to see all the incredible products they have to offer. For a limited time, get 10% off and free shipping. That's liveouter.com slash the founder hour. Terms and conditions apply. Hey everyone, before we get into the episode, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy what you hear, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That way you get notified when new episodes drop. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, at the founder hour. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Founder Hour, where we uncover the stories behind the world's most remarkable entrepreneurs. In this episode, we have the distinct honor of sitting down with a true pioneer of conscious business, John Mackey, the visionary founder of Whole Foods Market. Imagine a time when the term organic wasn't part of our daily lexicon and health food stores were few and far between. John's journey began in the 1970s when he and a group of like-minded individuals embarked on a mission to bring wholesome, natural foods to their community. Their small, unconventional vegetarian store in Austin, Texas, was the birthplace of what would become a revolution in the grocery industry. With passion, resilience, and a commitment to their values, they turned that humble store into the thriving global phenomenon we now know as Whole Foods Market. In this episode, we'll dive into John's upbringing and the incredible founding story of Whole Foods, a story of daring innovation, the pursuit of a higher purpose, and a relentless dedication to quality. Join us for an enlightening episode with John Mackey as he shares the highs, lows, and pivotal moments that defined his on entrepreneurial journey and transform the way we eat and shop for good. Here we go. John, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, we appreciate you joining us um, and are excited to, to chat. And so um, we always like to start from the very, very beginning of the person um, before we even talk about what they've done business-wise. So, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what young John was like as far back as you can remember. Um, what did you enjoy doing? What did you spend your time doing? What did you want to be when you grew up? I kind of grew up in what I uh, was a pretty typical middle-class family in the fifties and sixties and all the sitcom type shows like from, um, father knows best to leave it to beaver. All those kind of stories were that's, that's how I grew up sort of the, the um, um, My dad was a college professor back then teaching accounting at Rice University in Houston. So I grew up in Houston. And, um, you know, what what I like to do when I was a little boy, I loved I love sports. I love games. And you'll see that's a theme for me uh, through my entire life. I love to play. Play is where it's at. As an entrepreneur, in my experience, fairly creative and playful people. So I love to play. I was very... uh, very intense about my play. I, I really focus on it. And, uh, you know, I, so I, people say I'm highly competitive and I'm what probably sports? competitive you- in, in pretty much anything games, but I don't, I've reached the age where, you know, when you get older, you lose a lot more than you used to lose when you were younger. So, so I don't take it quite as seriously as I used to. And I don't, I don't really mind losing to, as much as I did when I was younger. So play, I was into play as a kid and um, into sports. You know, I, when, when I was a little boy, there was no doubt what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. You know, Willie Mays was my hero. And um, I just, you know, I just was all about baseball. And then, then I got a little older and I got into basketball too. So those were kind of my two sports, baseball and basketball. And uh, yeah, I played, I played High school base, basketball, I played a year of college. I played city league until I was in my mid-40s. And, you know, then I just – I'd become what I hated when I was a younger player, which is I was an old – I'd become an older guy that couldn't couldn't guard the younger player, so I'd have to grab them. And that's what they used to do to me. And I knew it was time to hang it up <laughs> when I became a grabber. <laughs> that's funny. John, what was life like at home? What were your – what did your parents do? Well, my dad was a college professor and my mom was a homemaker. That was in the kind of the generation where it was kind of like, well, no wife of mine's going to work there. You know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the breadwinner. And, 
and uh, she's going to take care of the kids and the house and, and, you know, take care of the family. And that's, that was a division of labor. And, um, what was it like? I know this is a slight deviation from your story perhaps, but you know, you bring it up and we like to just have random conversations as a topic comes up that interests us, but where or how, or when did things change at home for Americans? Let's call it where there was no longer, or the division of labor of, you know, the wife is no longer just the homemaker. When did that change? I think that changed my, I think my, I'm a baby boomer. And I think my generation changed that. Um, women began to, uh, they didn't want to, do, they didn't want to be homemakers with, with, when you had the, um, when the pill was invented and women could begin to not have babies and they could begin to, you had the whole, what they call the women's liberation movement back in the 60s and 70s. And that was about women breaking the glass ceiling, women coming into becoming doctors and lawyers. And when I was young, I mean, really most, the career paths were open to women were kind of um, as either teachers or secretaries. It was definitely a, you know, definitely a patriarchy. And uh, yeah. that began in my generation changed that. I mean, the women, yeah. I, I, I always, I went to school. Women were super smart. I had, I, I knew women were smart and capable because girls were. And so I, I never, I didn't really inherit that stuff about women somehow or another, you know, being just all emotional and whatnot, because they were, they were smarter than the, the boys. So, um, the, but there was, you know, they had to overcome the resistance of the generations that had been before them. And, you know, the boomer generation was a rebellious generation. And it rebelled in so many different ways, not just um, it, it rebelled spiritually. Uh, it rebelled um, in terms of empowering women. It, it rebelled in terms of civil rights and uh, tr- trying to move our society to a more um, equal opportunity society, regardless of your gender. And also that's when, you know, the gay movement really began to take off in my generation. They began to... Uh, push back against being, you know, uh, discriminated against. So uh, I was not, the, the, the older boomers were the, you know, I was like a middle boomer because I was born in 1953. Mm-hmm. So like my sister was born in 1945. And so she, she, she went out and got a master's in French literature and a PhD in psychology. And she banged really hard against, she was bitter and about um, how women were treated. And so she had to fight. She had to, she was one of those people fighting for women's, women's rights. You know, I was going to ask if you were a rebellious kid, but it sounds like probably many kids at the time because of just how the, what, where the world was at the time, um, or, you know, America, uh, were rebellious. And I, I know you ended up eventually going to college and studying philosophy and religion. Uh, what, what inspired you to, study philosophy was it just you know i'm going to take whatever major looks interesting or was there something deeper than that good question my life changed when i was 20 years old because i took lsd for the first time and that completely Mm -hmm. uh blew me away in terms of um wow uh this whole this is there's this whole inner world i had no idea about and that knocked I, i say that knocked me off the path that my parents and most of my friends were on and that path was Become a professional, go to school, and then go into go to become a lawyer, become a doctor, become an engineer, uh, become some kind of or go get a PhD and become some an academic. That was the path that most of my friends chose. But after I did LSD when I was twenty, I just it's like oh my god! I started studying Eastern philosophy. I wanted to study Western philosophy. I wanted to know the meaning of life, and I just knew there was a deeper spiritual component. That's what that's what awakens for me when I was twenty, and uh, that that set me on my we'll call it a hero's journey. It set me on my hero's journey, and uh, been on it ever since. From what you know about LSD or just like the experience of it, um, what happens? Like, is it things that are already in your subconscious that come to light, or is it something that maybe you've never even thought about before that surfaces itself at that time? Like, for example, wanting to study this. We live in the exterior world for the most part, but imagine that there is an inner world that's 
every bit as deep and complex as the outer world. That you know, we talk about outer space as this infinite, but the inner space is also infinite. And so, uh, I just realized that the, the the story that I had been told about what life was about, the meaning of it, it just wasn't. It just fundamentally wasn't true. I had a I had a deep experience. I mean, you know, I mean, not at, at age twenty, but um, at age uh, twenty two on another LSD trip, I, I experienced the ego death and I merged into the one, the one being, what I'd call just the, there's only the one being, there's only the one self. And I experienced that. And so, yeah, so they, that got me wanting to, you know, do meditation and yoga. I got into doing breath work and just to do the psycho, um, do the, these type of training methods that would help me access this higher level of consciousness, which I experienced. Uh, so psychedelics called it opened, opened a window or a door. It gives you a glimpse. It doesn't fundamentally, that doesn't change you, but it, it shows you that what's possible. And so I began that inner path. John, I feel like a lot of people that, you know, would have that LSD trip might have more anxiety and more nerves about life than maybe, you know, excitement or, motivation for more um wh why do you think that for you it it almost gave you this drive to learn more about yourself about life to go deeper versus running away i guess when you experience what i did which was a, a, again an ego death the sense of separation disappeared then the fear of death begins to go away as well because we are we are all a manifestation of that of that one being that one self so there's really nothing to be afraid of i mean the anxiety of of death that's the ultimate fe fear that we all have is you know our own mortality and so it's i began to, i began to rethink life as more of an adventure it's an adventure and it's to be explored and to be tasted and you're to learn and grow and savor and and be all that you can be, expand your consciousness. Um, what's the point of playing it safe? You can just hide out in your room your whole life, but the Grim Reaper is still going to come in and, and, you, and take you out one day. So, yeah, so live life. It's, it's an adventure. It's fun. And, and that, that, that kind of, with my whole spirit of play, uh, that also, my whole spirit of play was also, it been there as a little boy. It's like, wow, the universe is this amazing place I can play in. How cool is that? John, do you think the narrative has changed though? Do you think the, the, the new generation now in 2023, you know, going into 2024, do you think that now the narrative of, you know, life and what life is about has changed? And is that also because of the boomer generation and the realizations they came to and the rebellion that they led against what society, you know, is and should be? I just believe things continue to evolve. Consciousness evolves. So the boomers, you know, my generation did a lot to create, but uh, to create certain new pathways. But then there was a crackdown against that. You know, how the drug warriors came in and made all this stuff so illegal that if you got caught with it, you might end up in prison for 20 years. It was, you know, they were scared to death because their kids were, they were, you know, they were, they were, Timothy Leary was there, you know, um, Turn on, tune in, drop out, and they like they didn't want their kids to drop out, so they were all freaked out about it. But you know, they're they're my my parents' generation. They're all dead now. They're 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 off the stage. They're gone. So the drug warriors have gradually faded. And what's fascinating to me right now is that you're having sort of a there's sort of a spiritual great awakening occurring. I think right now because the younger generation is experimenting without all of, without the total fear uh, that they're on their own spiritual journey. I, I, I see, you know, now that now the big thing after Michael Pollan's book came out, um, how to change your mind, Pollan, um, you know, puts the scientific research and things like MDMA, psilocybin, these things, if people are suffering from uh, post traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, they, they talk therapy doesn't solve their problems, but, a guided journey on psilocybin and MDMA possibly will, will, will and like 70% of the people that do that report 
massive transformation is occurring. So, so these, these substances are coming in in a therapeutic way. They weren't used, they might have been used therapeutically, but they were, you're getting street drugs before. And, and now, like, now you have two states, uh, Oregon and Colorado, that have, are basically legalizing these substances for therapeutic purposes. And just so I think, I, I think we're in a sea change in terms of the world will be very different now, 15 or 20 years from now, as, as more states open up. And because those are, those are consciousness accelerants. And yeah, some people in our organism are scared to death, but uh, many other people will use them and they'll be transformed. Mm-hmm. In the in the spirit of play and adventure, I read that um, you end up leaving college, uh, didn't finish college uh, or your cr- credits that you needed um, to end up um, joining a vegetarian co-op when you were like 23 years old and that you weren't a vegetarian at the time. You just wanted to just meet people and have a different sort of experience. What was that experience like when you first got there and who was the coolest people you met there? That's such a good question. And that was a, that was a life transforming experience for me. I moved into this vegetarian co-op when I was 23 years old. And soon after I, I can mean, you explain w- what that is? Well, it was a housing co-op. So it was like in a big Victorian house. And there were, we had about, um, 20 people living there, about 10 bedrooms and you'd, you'd have a roommate. And so, um, and it was vegetarian. I wasn't vegetarian when I moved in there. I just thought, you know, I'm going to meet some super cool. I was into all things counterculture. You know, I'm, all, I'm studying Eastern religions, meditating. I'm, I'm studying philosophy, Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy, both. And I thought, man, I am going to meet some really cool people in this vegetarian co-op. And cause they're all, they're all counterculture. They're all hippies. And uh, I did. I met, I met my girlfriend that I co-founded Whole Foods with, Renee. And the reason that co-op changed my life is because I, I, I had what I call my food awakening. It was like before then, I knew that exercise could make you feel better, right? But I didn't really, I just, I, I, before that, I moved on that co-op. I kind of thought food was more like, you know, just energy. It's like, you know, like going to the gas station and getting some energy, you know, filling up your tank. Food is about, you know, energy. I didn't think about it as nutrition. I didn't think of it as nourishing every cell in my body and strengthening my energy levels, my immune system, et cetera. So my food awakening occurred in that co-op and because everybody else was really into it. So I became a vegetarian and I began, I learned how to cook. I didn't know how to cook when I went in there. I, I didn't, I didn't eat any vegetables. I only vegetable ate until I was about in my early twenties was like pickles. If, if that counts. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I was going to ask you, John, as, as a kid or growing up in your, uh, you know, family's home, did, were you guys eating generally healthy or what was the food no. situation like? No, uh, we were not eating very healthy. We, we were eating the standard American diet. Fast foods were just coming into the scene. I remember when McDonald's kind of got, got cranking up and came to Texas. And um, my mother was all about like, wow, TV dinners. This is so cool. I just mm. put this dinner in, not a microwave. They didn't exist. I just put this micro, I just put this in the oven and jump. Yeah, my kid's food's taken care of. Or, um, you know, macaroni and cheese in a can. Or, um, so, uh, Pop-Tarts. I mean, the, mo- most of the processed foods that you, that have long time brands, they were, they were invented in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And my generation was the first generation to start eating them. And that, that has not proven to be good for people's health. And America, thank you to the boomers for ruining Americans. Well, the boomers, we were just kids. We didn't, we didn't, <laughs> we, we didn't invent that food. Our parents invented that food. <laughs> we, we were the victims of it. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so anyway, I learned how to cook. I became the food buyer for the co-op and I was just excited about natural and organic foods I, because I realized, wow, I can feel better if I eat better. I have more energy. I, I don't get sick as much. So that was like a complete awakening for me. And I went to work for this small natural food store called um, the Good Food Company and uh, became the assistant manager there after just a few months. And uh, I loved it. I, I I'd never worked in a retail store before, and I really liked it. And I was pretty good at it. So I remember coming home one day after a day's work and uh, 
talking to my girlfriend, Renee, who lived at the co-op and she, I was 23, she was 19. And I said, Hey, Renee, what do you think about if we opened up our own store? And she said, that'd be a great idea. Let's do that. And I often wonder if she'd said, that's a stupid idea. What do we know about that? We're not going to do that. I'm not, I don't want to do that. Ah, there may not be a Whole Foods market, but she said she was very enthusiastic about it. So we went out and be, I became an entrepreneur. We started hustling money from our friends and families and we raised $45,000, found a big house. Our first store was called Safer Way, Safeway, Safer Way. And we tried to, um, we didn't know anything about, we didn't know anything. We were just a bunch, couple of idealistic kids. And the, uh, this, we, we just thought it'd be cool to be in a big house, you know, not a storefront. So we were on a more of a road that didn't get very much traffic. And it's a beautiful house. I was just showing it. That house is, I'm only about a half mile from that location where I'm sitting right now. And it's, it was a beautiful house. And we, it was a vegetarian store. We opened a vegetarian store and a vegetarian cafe. And, and then Renee and I ended up moving out of the co-op to save money. And we lived on the third floor of the store where we didn't even have a shower or anything. We, just, we, took, we took showers in the Hobart dishwasher um, when we needed to get clean. So that was, the, that was the beginning of that adventure. You know, you often, uh, I've heard you've, t- you've talked about like aligning, um, one's values with sort of what you end up doing, like your business or something, you start something that is connected to what you believe in. And it sounds like, you know, in retrospect, it's easy to look back and say, well, that's how I was. And so like, that's why I started that business. But at the time you were living it. And I'm always fascinated by that moment when someone realizes, well, maybe this is what I'm sort of meant to do. Um, and you kind of, collide with opportunity and so for you at that moment did you feel like you were onto something big like this was going to be something that was going to yeah be your path forever not at all this it was it was just play it would be fun to create our own store it'll be an adventure i thought i'd do it for a few years then go on to the next adventure right and um in fact that's what renee did she after just a few years we broke up. She said, this is kind of your trip. You really want to do this food thing. And I, I want to do other things. She moved to Belize. We broke up. She moved to Belize. And, uh, but she did keep her stock, which was a smart thing to do. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> John, how does that work? Like, how does that mindset of, you know, I'll do this for a few years. I'll do something else after that. 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 I mean, does that not cause you any sort of anxiety of like well okay this is going to last about two three years and then i don't know what i'm going to do next but i'll figure it out like th- did that not matter to you it, you were just kind of living in the moment i was just having fun i just can't i can't emphasize this too much for me it was a form of mm-hmm. play and uh i i didn't have any master plan to grow whole foods i mean i didn't safer for way but i didn't know anything about business but what happened is I, I can learn very quickly and rapidly. I'm a, I'm, I'm a voracious reader. I began to read. I, I didn't know anything about business and I wanted to. So I just started reading accounting books, finance books, marketing books. You know, I got, I'm sure I read hundreds of, of management books, all kinds of books. My dad was, a, you know, again, this point, he, he stopped being a college professor by this time. And he was actually managing his own company, uh, ended up being a public hospital management company called LifeMart. So he was CEO of that. And uh, he, he became my mentor. For about the first 16 years of the business, my dad, I didn't make an important decision without checking it with him first and getting his advice. That was really good for our relationship because when we were young, he, we used to play sports together and games together. But um, when I got into my teenage years, my early 20s, I kind of thought my dad was kind of a square. And... Uh, um, not, not super cool, just, you know, accounting guy. So, but when I started business and I realized, you know, my old man has, he, he knows a lot of stuff. And so I began, I, we got really close. My father and I, I was very, very close to my father. He was the best man at my wedding. And, um, and, and so that, that's how one of the reasons we were able to be successful. Safer Way was not particularly successful. It was a vegetarian store and we were very pure. We didn't, you know, we didn't sell, you know, we sell coffee. We didn't sell alcohol. You know, we didn't really sell white sugar. So we were very pure. And 
we didn't do that much business. And what we decided to do as we got, as we, as we lost, we started with $45,000 in capital and we lost half of it in the first year, 23,000 bucks. Renee and I were living in the store. We weren't really taking any money out of this, out of the business at all. And we were working really long hours. And, but we began to figure out the business and how to be successful. So we made a small, like $5,000 in year two. And I knew we needed to get a bigger location and, and we needed to be on a high traffic road. I knew, I'd begin to learn about business and about retail. So I went back and talked to our investors and said, we need to do another store, bigger store. We're, we're in a bad competitive position here. And they said, well, you know, John, you lost half your money your first year. And we're glad you're making a little bit of money this year. Let's take, let's do that for the next few years. And they said, well, I don't know if we won't survive if we do that. So the challenge that the other investors put to me, if you can find another major investor, then you know, we'll, we'll, we'll consider investing more money ourselves and, and do a bigger location. And of course, the strategy there was who would be stupid enough to invest any more money in this business? And, and, but I found one of my basketball buddies and inherited a lot of money from his, when his parents died. And he, this is Jay, Jay, his name was Jay, Jay Templeton. And, uh, he was a customer. He was a, he liked, he liked safer way. He, he would, his, his, he had a construction business that was nearby. So I got, I talked to Jay one day after playing basketball with him and, and he said, well, let's talk about it. And he invest, he ended up investing, I don't know, 50 K. And then we got more money from the other, uh, the existing investors. And we relocated to this bigger location that was 10,500 square feet. That was a completely, then the element of luck came in. That was a great location. You know, it just was fantastic within six months of opening that that first whole and chain, we changed the name to Whole Foods. Started selling meat, seafood, beer and wine, coffee. We wanted to be kind of a one-stop natural food store or supermarket. I know you also um, approached two gentlemen, Craig and Mark, who had their own grocery. It was Correct. Clarksville Natural Grocery to partner with them, and yes. they were like sort of like your competition at the time. And and you, you know, I, I've heard you say they were doing really well, and they were sort of selling other products like meat and things like yes. that, which you weren't. Why did you decide to partner with them and, you know, not just do it on your own? Like oftentimes we hear advice of like, you know, don't have too many partners in business. It's just going to create too many chefs in the kitchen. It's going to create too much conflict. And you, it, and it sounds like you weren't in a position that you really needed to partner with them, or maybe you were, but why did you do that? It's a good question. In, in, in my book, I go into this in, in some detail and there were some problems too, so that your first instinct was correct as well. One of the, Mark, one of the co-founders hated me as the CEO and, and thought I was, called me wacky macky, all into the, all this new age spirituality and, you know, taking MDMA and wanting to start up consciousness stuff. And he, he thought it was just nuts. And, but I got to know Craig and Mark because um, they were competitors, true, but we, I started a company called Texas Health Distributors. We were trying to buy better. And so we set up a little, our own little wholesale company. And Clarksville was a customer. So in, in Austin in that time, you had, the, you had the food co-ops that were a business. And you had Good Foods, which had five stores. That's where I had worked when I wanted to start my own store. And then you have sort of the independents. So by starting Texas Health Distributors, we began to distribute to all the independents including Clarksville Natural Grocery, where Craig and Mark worked. So I got to know Craig and Mark by selling to them wholesale, like this wholesale buying club. And uh, and the, better, the more I watched them, how they worked, the more I liked them. We became friends, basically, through that distribution company. And then I said, guys, we signed this big location. You know, it's only a mile away from Clarksville where you guys are at. And, and um we should team up. You should, you should partner with us. We should, we, we, we can do this together. We're much more likely to be successful if we do it together because I really, I liked both of them, but I just thought Craig Weller, he was like eight years older than me. And he just, he looked like Robert Redford, I swear. And uh, he, he, he was, he was the hardest worker of anybody I ever worked with at Whole Foods. He worked, he definitely worked 80 hours a week and he just had a perfect attitude he was so great. I said, I want to work with this guy. You know, we're going to be a dynamite team together. And they, I couldn't convince them. They, they didn't want to give up their independence until about two weeks before Whole Foods was going to open. They used to come down and watch it being constructed, right? And then finally, I guess they saw it 
saw we were going to open this incredible store and they're going to have trouble competing with it. They finally said, let's do it. We're in. So then we had to change the name. It came up with the Whole Foods Market name and we had a great partnership. How'd you come up with the name? Well, we didn't want to be called Clarksville Natural Grocery. We weren't even in Clarksville and they didn't want to call, be called Safer Way. So we, we, we actually got fell into the name as a group. We had kind of brought the team together and we were talking about, well, what are we? It's like, well, I really like the word market. My contribution to the name was market. And, uh, and then we, and so it's like, well, what kind of market are we? Yeah, we're kind of a natural foods market. Oh, that sounds really generic. We're, we're, we're still an organic, we're an organic market, but we don't have that much organic stuff. Uh, well, we're a health food market, but no, those are pill shops. We don't want to be that. So it was like, and then, and then it was like, well, I think Renee or David or, or somebody on the team, there, there's a magazine out called Whole Foods Magazine. It was a trade magazine. It, the first issue came out. And so she picks it up and, and she looks at it and says, why don't we just call ourselves Whole Foods Market? And, um, and everybody said, yeah, that, that's, that's, that works. And you have to understand that was not Whole Foods was not commonly used back in the, um, you know, middle to late seventies. It's now that now we've made that yeah. sort of phrase popular, but back then it was a unique name. So that, that's how we got the name. Not, not a lot of marketing study on that. <laughs> the theme I'm hearing here is that you guys weren't very good at copyright and trademark because you guys would just steal names, whether it was safe way to safer way or whole food <laughs> you have magazine no to whole foods market. <laughs> I, I can tell you so many, I can tell you in the, and in the book, I, I do talk about it. Some of the early stories, like, I mean, let's take safer way. For example, we're working, we're building the store out ourselves. We don't, we didn't hire any architects. We didn't hire contractors. We didn't hire engineers. We we're just a bunch of hippies, a bunch of kids. And we were, you know, but some of them were carpenters and some of them, our friends were electricians. And so they had the skill sets. And so we hired them and we're doing this on a shoestring budget. And then one day this guy from the city comes into the store while we're working and he says, what the hell are you guys doing here? And he says, well, we're going to open a natural food store. And he said, well, let me see your permits. And I said, what permits? He said, you don't have any permits? And I said, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. And he said, well, you need a, you need a building permit. Or you can't be building this and you need to have engineering. You need to have engineering plans, and architecture plan. And I said, well, I didn't know we needed to have that stuff. And, and he said, well, you, I'm shutting you down. You need to go get those plans from the city. So I go down and talk to the city. And they said, yeah, you can't do this without architectural plans and engineering plans. And I said, well, how long is it going to take? He says, well, I don't know. It's, you know. And then you have to get approval by the city. And I said, man, that sounds like that's going to take a lot of time. And they said, yeah, it would probably take you a few months. And I said, a few months? We don't have, a, we don't have enough money to do that. And he said, well, I'm sorry, son. That's just the way it is. So that very day I come back to Safeway and I'm telling the guys, we're, you know, they shut us down. And our landlord, who is this Lebanese immigrant named Eddie Joseph, and he was probably only about the age I am now, 70, but I thought he was like, you know, 100 years old. And, and, he, <laughs> and I exp was explaining to him the problem. And I said, the city won't let us do this, Mr. Joseph. You know, this says we got to get all these building permit and architectural plans. And we just don't have the money to do that. And he puts his arm around me and he says, he says, John, the city's never going to let you build this thing. So here's what you got to do. He said, he said, listen, these guys all go home at five o'clock. You just build your store at night. You keep it dark during the day when they, and they're, and so that's what we did. We built our store at night and we never, we never got a building permit. We never got any of that stuff done. Now, we passed all the inspections after it was open, right? You have to, you know, the fire department and the, all of them came in and we all got passed. All electricity, every, plumbing, everything passed. But um, so, yeah, we rebelled. We were we rebelled. We cheated, I suppose. Um, uh, but for, quite frankly, we, we just innovated around a governmental hurdle. That's how I saw it. You know, it's interesting because... So I'm part Lebanese and I'm not surprised by the response that, you know, your landlord gave you because I feel like with the immigrant mentality, they're always looking for ways around whatever yeah. they're supposed to be doing. And a lot of times, I mean, these are like really stupid things, you know, architectural plans, maybe are a little stupid engineering plans, maybe make a little bit more sense. So the place doesn't fall down and, you know, there's no liabilities or whatever, but it's always interesting that, you know, you, you hear these stories of entrepreneurship and they're never 
oh, let's just do exactly what we're supposed to do, right? It's, it's let's just do it. And along the way, we're going to get hit all the time. And we're going to try to find a way to work around that thing and then go work around the other thing. And it just feels like it's just jumping a bunch of hurdles and, you know, knives are coming at you and you're like, it doesn't matter. We're going to keep going. You know, did you enjoy, I mean, for you, somebody that likes games and adventure, it seems like this was all just like a video game and you're just going through different obstacles. Yeah. Except there were no video games back then. So I didn't have that metaphor. Yeah, that's true. uh, (laughs) We have it now. But in in, most of the entrepreneurs I've known, uh, and I've known a lot of them, uh, they do have that playful spirit, but we like to figure things out as we go along. Most entrepreneurs are not big planners, right? They're not the ones that do these strategic plans. Entrepreneurs like to innovate and create, and they, when they find a problem, they figure a way to solve it or they innovate around it so that the problem doesn't stop them. And most, most entrepreneurs I know, and I've fallen in this category, we're not easily discouraged. It's like we can get frustrated but then we just, uh, that's just a, a call for more creative thinking. And so, you know, I, if you look at like somebody like Elon Musk, for example, what's fascinating to me is, you know, the, if you, his SpaceX story is even more interesting in a lot of ways than the Tesla story, in my opinion, because in SpaceX, you know, he, he goes over to Russia because he, he wants, you know, he wants to do some rockets and they're, and they're the only ones making rockets. They wouldn't sell him any cheap rockets. So he starts figuring out, he says, you know, I just think we'll build our own rockets. We don't need their damn rockets. We can build it cheaper than they do. So he begins to, to, build, his, he, to build his own rockets. And, he, and then he's asking, well, why do they throw all these rockets away? Wouldn't it be better if you, if, you, if you could reuse them? And so he innovates to do that. But the best story of all, of course, is that um, he ends up creating Starlink, you know, as he starts launching satellites. And, then he, and, and, and Starlink... You know, he's trying, he has this mission, right? He's trying to get to Mars. That's, that's the ultimate mission. But in creating and solving problems, he invents other businesses like the satellite launching business, like Starlink, which is going to have a, you know, complete high speed internet without needing um, cell towers all around the world through, through low flying satellites. So that, that's, he's like almost the greatest example, in my opinion, of inventing as new problems come up, he invents new whole new business models to solve problems that appear. So I think entrepreneurs tend to do similar things, like even if they're not as on the scale that someone like Elon does does it at. Yeah, that that first Whole Foods location seemingly was like a success overnight in a sense, where like you you opened it and I think the first day you had people coming in and it was it was a hit. What were some challenges that you faced? early on, um, whether it was with the team, with the store, with the business? The first challenges we, we faced initially were we, were we were operating very small stores that didn't do very much sales volume, even with our combined sales. We did more sales in the first day than, than I thought we were probably going to end up doing in a week. It was, we were so crowded. So the first challenge was getting more, more people hired because initially our staffing was just kind of the people from the two stores that we combined. So we had the first was getting people to work there and getting inventory. We did not have enough inventory. We took all the inventory from our stores and then we needed to really order more inventory. And we, we, we opened before we were ready to open. We just, we couldn't meet payroll. And so we opened to sell inventory so we could pay our payroll. So we, we didn't, we opened without a meat department. We didn't have a butcher yet, no seafood and our beer and wine. We didn't have our license yet from the state to, um, to be able to sell beer and wine. So we opened before we were ready. It didn't matter. Austin had been, they were so ready for the store. It just shot out of the blocks. And, um, and so one, one challenge we faced, this is going to, this, this is in my opinion, a good story. Again, in a small store, everybody does everything. You, you don't, you, you don't just work a cash register or you don't just do produce or meat. You do everything. you, uh, you might work for cashier, cash register for a while, then you're stocking produce, and then, then you're working in the bulk department, and now you're taking out the trash, and everybody's like doing everything. And so, but as you get bigger, you, we discovered, you know, we have to specialize. We have to pe- have people that are only cashiers and only do produce and only do meat and seafood. And that was like a shock to people. It was like, Man, we're becoming a big corporate corporation now. Look at this. You know, I'm 
I'm just strictly a, I'm just cutting cheese all day long. And so that, that was one of the first things we had to innovate. We thought we were innovating. We thought we were creating something no one else had ever done before. In fact, everybody in the supermarket business was doing that. We just, nobody that was working for us had ever worked in a supermarket before, I guess, except for the meat cutters, the only ones that ever had. So we had all kinds of challenges and, um, but we were all working so hard and we were, you know, we were having, we were successful and we were having fun. So it was like, um, that was really one of the happiest periods of my entire life. I mean, I was, we, first of all, you're young. And so you're just young and your whole life's ahead of you. And, and, uh, you, you taste success. I started to make some money. I mean, I was just a really poor guy. And uh, I mean, Renee and I didn't take any salaries really when we were at Safeway, a couple hundred bucks a month each. And I remember when I got a pay raise, I was making $800 a month. And I thought, oh my God, I'm rich. This is incredible. So I went out and I bought a used car. It was like my first car I'd ever owned. So, it was, so there was that, there was that heady feeling of, of um, success. Then the biggest challenge, of course, was nine months after we opened the first Whole Foods market, Austin had a hundred year flood and we were in the flood zone and our store was wiped out, the famous flood that wiped us out, which turned out to be a really good thing in in hindsight, because that's kind of how we learned about stakeholders because the stakeholders wouldn't let us die. I'll just tell you one story about that. For example, one thing that saved us is the bank in Austin, City National Bank in Austin loaned us, um, $100,000 $100,000 on my signature. And then about, about 10 years ago, I was at this conference and I ran into this, this old guy and he, he said, I, John, I used to work at City National Bank and you remember Mark Monroe, don't you? And I said, yeah, Mark Monroe, he's our banker. You know, back when we had the flood and, and the bank bailed us out on my signature, I, I, I was always amazed that they did that. And he starts laughing and he says, you don't know what happened. And I said, yeah, I do. I mean, they loaned us the money and it saved, it saved us. He said, John, the bank turned that loan down. I said, no, they didn't. They gave us the money. He said, John, Mark Monroe, the banker, personally guaranteed the loan. Wow. I said, what do you mean he personally guaranteed the loan? He said, yeah, he said he knew John Mackey. And John Mackey, would, if it took him the rest of his life, he'd pay back that loan. Because he, he said he would and, he, and I believe him. So I said, you're kidding me. Mark did that. He never told me that. And I said, I got to thank him. He said, well, it's too late. He died about five years ago. So we had people like that, and suppliers giving us new inventory. There was this rallying around Whole Foods Market. We had a benefit. We had a big benefit ban- band played for a big benefit to help us fund it. Our neighbors came in and helped us clean up the store. And uh, so it was an incredible experience and really kind of brought us together. Also, that led to the second store. Mm. It's like we can't we can't risk our whole business again. And if another flood came out, we might not be able to recover from it. If you hadn't seen the community rally, you know, money aside and enough funding aside, if you hadn't seen the community rally the way they did, would it have still given you the conviction that this is going to be something that I need to keep doing? Or, or at the moment, did you feel a little like lost of like, do I keep going or not? That is a great question because. I felt a multiplicity of diverse feelings. On the one hand, you know, we were just heartbroken because we'd worked so hard and you just have to, the the flood completely destroyed the store. I mean, we had sewage and, and, you know, every, all the, the, it came in like a, like a tidal wave and knocked everything over. And the store was, you know, pretty much a total loss. And, uh, and so we just, we didn't have flood insurance and we just thought, I don't think we can recover from this. On the other hand, we had had, we, before that flood, we were the highest volume natural food store in the United States based on what I knew about other stores. And I thought, you know what, if we can figure out a way to get this thing open again, we, we can, you know, we can come back from this. And uh, I think the fact that our, uh, the suppliers fronted us new inventory, we got the bank loan, uh, the investors put a little bit more money in, and the, our employees work for nothing until we got back on our feet and then we, you know, then we could pay him when we started selling inventory again. So it was discouraging. And, uh, but it, it also really created a spree de core when, you know, when you meet a challenge as a, as a team and you overcome it, everybody feels so amazing. There's so much love and so much connection so that the flood really kind of brought us together. And, and, uh, 
I don't know what would happen if we hadn't had that flood. We'd had to make something up. John, what was it about what was it about Whole Foods Market that you think got such a big community, such a big following? Obviously, to this day, that following exists and probably is still growing. Um, but what was it at the time that you think drew so many people to the store? You know, the best way I can explain it is that um, the people, when we tried to raise money, like we raise out venture capital money, we got turned down most of the time. And what I heard again and again and again was, you guys are all just a bunch of hippies. You know, if you look, if I showed you a picture of people working for us, nobody was over 30, except for maybe Craig. And everybody had super long hair and beards and, and uh, you know, dressing in hippie clothing. And um, so we were selling food mostly to other hippies. The counterculture loved us. We were like, this was their alternative food store. And it was authentic. We weren't, we weren't um, guys with MBAs coming out of, Wharton with the business plan, we were just homegrown. And uh, um, I think, so we had that appeal to the generation of people that were like ourselves as the boomers began to, as they, as they got into their twenties and thirties, we were the food store that they could identify with and liked. So, and the, and the co-ops could have done that. They kind of blew it because co-ops were so politicized. You know, they were all about what they were going to boycott and uh, uh, you're a member. So you, you, the idea that since you're a member, everybody owns it, uh, food for people, not for profit. They could never accumulate any capital. And so they couldn't really improve their stores. So um, it just caught on. And I think it's partly our idealism. I mean, we were um, and we worked really hard and we gave good service and and uh, we cared. We're passionate people. And I think that just... And just for context, this was the mid to late 70s, right? Yeah. Well, the uh, Safer Way opened up in 1978 and Whole Foods, first Whole Foods opened up in 1980. Mm -hmm. so, you know, just hearing hearing so far your story, I feel like a lot of people that aren't wired the way you are might have quit somewhere along the way because there's so many obstacles and challenges. And I'm just curious in your perspective, you know, oftentimes, you know, when you hear investors saying that, you know, you guys are just a bunch of hippies. This is not going to be a big thing for us to invest in. It could easily discourage you when you haven't had business experience, right? And you mentioned not having business experience and reading business books and things like that. Do you think that naivete at the time was a benefit for you when you didn't really know what the road was like ahead of just, I'm just going to, you know, oh, go yeah. on this adventure and it's, you know, you're absolutely yeah. correct. I mean, uh, if I'd, if I'd known what Whole Foods was going to become, it would have scared me. I would have thought, I can't do this. That's too big of a request. I'm, I'm not capable of it, right? But I didn't, I wasn't looking that far ahead. I wasn't thinking we were going to have, you know, we were going to be a multi billion dollar company with 22 billion when I retired in sales. And it just never occurred to me. If I had somebody told me that, I probably would have said, oh, I don't want to do that. Forget it. I'm out. Um, but, I'm the kind of guy, like I, you know, I like to play games and I'm very competitive. And when people would say, when they would say, you're just a bunch of hippies, you know, you know, you can't compete, you can't compete with Safeway and you can't compete with, with HEB and those guys. And I was thinking, yeah, we'll show, I'll sh we'll show you what we can do. You know, that's, that's kind of the attitude we had. I kind of, we're going to prove it to you. So yeah. I'm, I'm not an easily discouraged person and, and, and when I, when I run up against a, a hurdle, I figure out a way to get around that hurdle. If I can't jump over it, I figure a way around it. So, and I, I, I think that's probably characteristic of most entrepreneurs because, you know, you, it's easy to get discouraged you, and easy things, bad things happen. You know, you had a flood and, uh, uh, you know, Renee quit and left. And I mean, stuff happens and uh, you just have to, you have to be resilient you have to be resilient. You have to continue to. Uh, one of my favorite business books is, is Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog. I don't know if you guys read that one or not. Fantastic. Book. Love that book. And yeah, uh, love that's that kind book. of that's my benchmark for the whole story. And I mm. Phil would just say again and again and again, just put the just put the next foot forward. Just keep keep going right. forward. Keep going forward. And uh, I totally identify with that. Just keep going forward. Just keep moving.
You mentioned Renee and and sort of the strain that starting Whole Foods or any business at the, at the time probably would had on your relationship. And obviously, we've heard so many stories of people that um you know have have had their relationships, marriages fall apart when they're starting a business. If you could go back, was there is there anything else you would have done differently at the time, or do you think it's just the nature of the game of that? Like it's really hard to balance the two. You know, Renee and I were so young when we started it, right? You know, I mean, we we're living in that co-op, and she's still a teenager, <laughs> and, and I'm not much older, and, and uh, we still love each other. I mean, it's just people grow apart, particularly when you're in your early 20s. You just – and you want to have other adventures. You want to know about other relationships potentially, and so um, I just think I just think that's what really happened. Renee and I just kind of – our paths began – we were, we were on the same path for a while, then they began to diverge over time until, until you asked the question. It's like, hey, you're doing, you're doing it. You want to do something different. I'm doing this. So let's, let's part as friends. And that's, you know, um, that's what we did. And then, John, what kind of leader were you? I mean, especially as Whole Foods was growing, were you just the, were, were you the visionary leader? Were you the operational guy? Were you the one coming up with the strategy of, okay, we're going to open another store here, another store here, another store here. We got to get this type of item, this type of product. Run us through kind of who you were and what and how you led uh, Whole Foods in those earlier days, you know, call it the first five to 10 years. Yeah, I, I, I'm more the visionary type of leader. Um, the big, you know, remember my background in philosophy and religion. I'm, I'm more, yeah. I'm an idealist. I'm a, I'm a dreamer. I inspire people. A good entrepreneur, you know, you, you read a Steve Jobs biography and they talk about his reality distortion field. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I love I that got, topic. I got, I got that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Because anybody that has a lot of passion about something can be infectious to other people. So that's, that charisma comes from that passion. And so I've always been a very passionate guy and I can, I have evangelical skills. I mean, I can, I, you know, I got Craig and Mark to want to join. I've, I've been able, you know, we, the companies that we've acquired, Whole Foods acquired over the years, part of that's just being able to go sell people um, to be excited about the potential of doing things together. So Craig Weller in the early days and Mark, they were the, they were the really much better operators than I was, but I was, I was the driver driver for innovation, for creativity, for trying new things, for thinking outside the box, for pushing growth. Uh, I, I really wanted to grow the company from, you know, after, after that flood, I really wanted to grow the company. And I remember when we just wanted to get out of Austin, we went to Houston. That was a big step. And then it was like, I remember the, the girl from, my girlfriend at the time also worked for Whole Foods named Mary Kay, became my first wife. Um, we took a trip to explore kind of the West and we went to, through LA and Mrs. Gucci's is there and went to the Bay area and we went all the way up the West coast and, and then came down through Colorado and we were a whole way. We were checking out natural food stores. We got to the Bay area and that's kind of the birthplace of the counterculture, right? That's where all the hippies are. San Francisco, the summer of love. They, that's, that's Marin County. I mean, they were like, um, uh, they didn't have any natural food supermarkets. We're, we're checking everything out and they had some good small stores. And I'm thinking to myself, holy smokes, this, this place. I remember when we, our first store was in Palo Alto and it was such a big decision for the company to do the first store outside of Texas that I actually lived in Palo Alto for a month. And my conclusion when I was, I went back to the team and I said, whoever invented the word yuppie probably lived in Palo Alto <laughs> because <laughs> that's how, that's how they were. There was, but there you had Stanford, but the, and I, I just knew Whole Foods was going to be very successful in the Bay Area. And we were. We, we were far more successful in the Bay Area than we were ever were. If you take, if you take the Bay Area, it, 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 we have more success there than the entire state of Texas combined. So, right. Um, I can imagine. The, the Bay Area is yeah. a fantastic. And John, were you, did, did you have a bunch of investors at this time or were you still like majority, 100% owner of the company? I've never, I, my most I ever owned of the company was. 20% that was safer way. And then hmm. uh, when I'd split up with some girlfriends, I, I'd give them stock, which, which made my father really angry. <laughs> he said, John, you, you either, you either have to um, stop having girlfriends or if you have them, you got to find some other way to 
appease your guilt rather than give them stock when you break <laughs> up with them. <laughs> John, if you're thinking of giving stock away, Pat and I, you know, we will, we will, we will. Amazon, Amazon has some. all my stock. I would have been hands. your girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, but uh, what, what was the question? Um, I got the, uh, the ownership and how much oh. you owned. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I never owned that much. And, uh, yeah. And then I, and I was giving it away and, and, uh, that's a whole nother story. But when we, to go into the Bay area in order to do that, we had to, we had to raise venture capital. It was a very difficult decision to make. And, uh, I came up with a metaphor about venture capitalists, which I'm, I, th- I think is a very fitting one. I, I see venture capitalists. They're, they're like hitchhikers with credit cards. As long as you get them to where they want to go, they help pay for the gas. But if you get a little bit lost on the road, they, they'll, they're willing to hijack the car, hire a new driver, and throw you out on the side of the road. So we we had trouble with the VC community because I kept hearing again and again and again. This was back in the day before. The VC, the whole universe of VCs right. is so much different than it was back in 1988. Oh, I was going to say it's, it was probably like a, it's like a rite of passage now to, to go to the Bay Area. You have to sort of go through VC, I feel like. But yeah, at the time, what was it like? Like, oh. Who were you even approaching? We did, we hired a, a small uh, investment banking firm based in Dallas at the time called Rauscher Pierce. I don't think they are independent and don't exist anymore. And we uh, they set up. We talked to venture capitalists in Dallas, Houston. Uh, well, I think Austin only had one back in that time. And we talked to them, and we also went on to Sand Hill Road and we talked to a ton of the the VCs there and. And uh, they, mm-hmm. what I heard again and again and again, I, I have this story in the book about, we talked to these VCs in Dallas, at, uh, Phillips and Smith, and um, they turned us down. And when I was going out, Don Phillips said, I, you know, I want to, I want to tell you why we're not investing. And I was like thinking, well, that's like a girl not going out on a date with you and wanting to tell you why should you want to go out on a date with you? Right. So it's like, but we sat down and listened to it. And he said, look, you got a nice little business here, but you know, let's face it. You guys are just a bunch of hippies. And I looked at your customer base and they're all just a bunch of hippies too. Now, how big a market can that be? What he didn't realize was that the, the world was changing and evolving, but he was my father's generation. So for him, this, you know, he just did not get it at all. And he said, and, and in case I'm wrong and uh, you guys really do do better, I just, how are you going to compete with Safeway in the long run? How can you compete with those guys? And he just thought, you, you, you're going to get crushed. And so we thanked him for his sage advice. I ran into him about a decade later, and he said that was the stupidest. That, that, that's, that was the biggest mistake he ever made as a venture capitalist. Was, uh, and so at least he had a good sense of humor about, about his little lecture he gave us. But we got money from uh, two Houston. We got three, 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 uh, three investment bankers. I mean, three VCs invested in us. The lead was a company called Vintex in Houston and another one called Criterion in Houston. And then the Sand Hill Road thing paid off because one of the top tier um, uh, VCs at that time and still today, I think, Oak Investments, they were interested. And they had a VC, a guy, Jerry um, uh, Gallagher, who had been a vice chairman of of, uh, the Target Target company. And... um, Mm -hmm. He loved Whole Foods and he loved me and he became a, one of my mentors because they invested and uh, the VCs were only in our car for about four years. And then we did an IPO. We, we did the IPO before we were really ready. We needed more cash and the, the VCs wanted to do another round. But my dad and I talked it over and if another round would give them majority control. And we said, yeah, they well, want to dilute you as much as possible. Yeah. We did not want them to take control of the business. So, uh, we said, we're going to do an IPO. We, we still had the votes. We said, they said, you're not ready for an IPO. And I said, well, we'll find out. And, uh, we, 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 we did an IPO with, I don't know, we had 12 stores and we did our IPO we raised, um, we raised about 20, $20 million, it's a really small IPO, but they, they valued our company at a hundred million bucks. And I was like, mm-hmm. shit, I'm rich. I'm a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very weird feeling having been so poor for so long 
Yeah. So, um, you know, you rate, you do this IPO, you have enough money now to, I think you started going on acquiring other grocers, right? To, to de- then convert it into Whole Foods. Well, what right? ended up happening is if you go back a little bit, back in the early eighties, one of the guys that became president of Whole Foods market based in New Orleans, a man named Peter Roy. And he, he, his, his business was named the whole whole food company in New Orleans. He had two stores and Peter and I got to be good friends and he created something called the Natural Foods Network. And he basically, um, P- Peter helped get together. We, we, all the other natural food supermarkets around the United States began to meet about three times a year to share, sort of share financials, share ideas. And um, uh, so there was like Bread and Circus in the Boston area and Mrs. Gooch's in L.A. There was... Unicorn Village in Florida, Alfalfa's in Colorado, and and over time, after we went public, we were we we pretty much acquired all the companies that were in the Natural Foods Network, and they were they, the entrepreneurs were ready to sell out, and they got really rich, and we got their intellectual capital, and we got their platform that enables to grow across the whole country. So that was uh, getting first to the. So that IPO ended up being strategically very important because we now had a currency called our stock plus the cash we'd raised in the IPO that enabled us to cash out all the other entrepreneurs that had been doing it for for you know a decade or so and really just were getting tired of it, just wanted the money. So we gave them their exit. The three leading companies when we did our IPO were was was Bread and Circus in Boston, Mrs. Gooch's in L.A., and Whole Foods Market based in Texas. And by that time, we were in the Bay Area. And when we put together those three companies, the intellectual capital that came together with Bread and Circus as perishables, Mrs. Gooch's in store design and in uh, purchasing, when we began to combine it all together into the one company, that's when we really could get to a takeoff point because we um, Whole Foods had a great culture, but Bread and Circus was, they were the perishable genius. And, and uh, uh, but combining them together, it's a great example of, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Together, those three companies is what, um, if Whole Foods hadn't acquired Bread and Circus and Mrs. Gooch's and, and been able to take their intellectual capital and, and, and inject it into the overall uh, culture of the company, we wouldn't we not have become the success we were. That was that, those marriages really helped make the company. Interesting, John. Along the way, at this time, did you feel as though the original mission of Whole Foods was being carried out, and you guys were still true to who you were? Yeah, as you were growing. Yes, I mean, if we go back a few years, back in 1985, um, one of the one of the uh, co-founders, Mark Skiles, uh, he had enough of Wacky Mackey, and uh, he. he uh, he he said I was going to wreck the I was going to bankrupt the company. He just he loved the first store. Our first store was so was a little gold mine, and Mark would have liked us just to stay there and just you know we, he could make so much money. We could make so much money off that one store. And I said, well, I, I want to grow, and he didn't want to. And then when we got to our fourth store, overall because some of these new stores had they didn't start that quickly, they had to grow into their to grow the brand. And when you went to Houston, it started really slowly, for example. And uh, he, he got so mad at me, he quit and we cashed him out. And so that was a, a very traumatic experience, but it led to us also then doing a values, sort of a, a vision search, a vision quest where we did a, we, we created our mission statement, our sense of purpose. We brought an outside consultant in and we worked through, got our, purpose articulated, got our core values established. And that was critical. That happened in 1985. And um, that was the foundation that enabled us. So in answer to your question, we, most entrepreneurs, this is a very important idea. Most entrepreneurs, they have that purpose within their hearts, within their own being, but it's often tacit. They often don't make it explicit. They don't articulate it. And that process of going through our kind of our vision quest helped us collectively to articulate who we were, what our purpose was, what our values were, what we were trying to do in the world. And, and then we were able to explain it to everybody else. And so everybody else could go along on the ride with us. So 
that's a very important entrepreneurs. They don't do that at some point, no matter how brilliant they are. Um, they'll lose their team because the team is like they're the entrepreneur saying, follow me. You know, I know the promised land, follow me. But if you don't tell them where you're going, eventually you get into the wilderness and they begin to get discouraged that maybe the hell you're following some kind of nut job. Who's not going to actually create a success. So creating and articulating your values it, it, at some point is very important to do. Yeah. So 2017, um, Amazon acquires Whole Foods. And I don't know if a lot of people saw that coming. I certainly didn't. And um, I'm curious what led to that, um, you know, the ac- acquisition why and why, even if you were looking to be acquired at the time, um, you felt that Amazon was the best suitor. It's a good question. And uh, in in my book, I just do this incredibly detailed uh, explanation that's got a lot of um, a lot of meat to it. So I'm going to have to give a more of a, a much abbreviated, get the cliff notes. Synopsis. Yeah, exactly. So um, for a long time, Whole Foods Market, we just sort of had this sort of natural organic market almost to ourselves. And, uh, you know, we had some competitors would come in and we acquired a lot of them, uh, fresh fields, wild oats. And, um, but what happened is back in about 2013, thereabouts, Whole Foods hit its all-time highest market capitalization. We, we, were, we were overvalued. We were, we were worth like um, – we had a, our market capitalization was $24 billion. And uh, we, were, we, were, we were valued very briefly more than any other food retailer in the United States besides Walmart. And um, even though like Kroger had 10 times as many sales as we had, but we were valued higher. And we had, you know, great same store sales. And, and, and that was kind of, in a lot of ways, you know, in 2014, F- Fortune put us on the cover and said, Whole Foods is, is taking over America. And I can only imagine what was going on in the, all these supermarkets, uh, boardrooms and management teams, because basically they began to copy us very aggressively. And th- they began to copy our marketing. They began to you know, say they had sustainable seafood and they had high animal welfare. A lot of it was just, you know, wasn't really true, but they uh, started copying the way we merchandise our produce and they, be, they began to cut the, 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 the perceived quality gap with Whole Foods Market. They be, and they picked up a lot more of our products in the center store and they just began to underprice us. And so and we had, um, it's just, there's a confluence of things that happened. We also got, clipped in New York by an ambitious uh, consumer affairs person saying that Whole Foods Market was overcharging people and uh, and finding us large amounts of money, even though, you know, there's always minor little mischarges that happen when you have to weigh things on scales and whatnot. And and we had, we, we undercharged our customers a lot more than we overcharged them, but the media ran wild with it and that hurt our brand. And um, so the gap began to cut down with, and the Fortune magazine put us on their cover uh, and said Whole Foods has taken over America. And, and the long and the short of it is, is that the competition got a lot better, and there were a lot of reasons why it got a lot better. And we, and our, uh, we began to be perceived as whole paycheck and sort of a you know rip off and and. Uh, and our same store sales began to decline. And we, as that happened, um, after a couple of years of sort of more mediocre performance, we had activists begin to take positions in the company. We had first, we had New Burger um, that took a position back probably in 2015 or early 2016. And then we had uh, Jana Partners take a position in 2017. And I mean, you'll, the deep story you read in the book is, is very eye opening. But um, I was just launching my book, Whole Foods Diet, and I was about to launch a book tour on it. And I was just landing in New York, and my phone, phone blew up when I turned it back on again when we landed, because that's when Jana announced their position in Whole Foods and that they wanted to replace our board of directors. And so my whole most of my book tour got canceled, but I had one meeting that was scheduled at Goldman Sachs. Interesting question. Why did Goldman Sachs 
asked me on this particular day to come talk to their people about my book on healthy eating. Uh, and so I did that talk. But right before the talk, I had the soon to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs, David Solomon, come up and say, you know, it's really, I know it's a difficult day for you. We really appreciate you being here. And just want you to know that, you know, Goldman Sachs is very good at defense against activists. And if you need any help, we'd sure like to give it for you. You know, I find out later on that um, Jana Partners had done the same thing with Safeway, and that's how they got acquired by Albertsons. And it just happened to be that Goldman Sachs was involved in that deal. Mm. So I think it's a very similar playbook. But we met with the Jana Partners team, and uh, or there a couple of guys came to Austin that, you know, we they had they got eight eight point eight percent of the company, and they they wanted to replace our board, and and uh, so we said we said, well, why don't you guys take a couple of board seats, and we can work together to make the company you know improve? And they said we don't want to take board seats. We 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 want you to sell the company, and we're going to force you to do it, whether you like it or not. We're going to take over your board and we're going to replace the management team and, and we're going to have this company put up to sale for the highest bidder. So they didn't want to, they didn't want to work with us at all. They just, they had their plan. And uh, uh, so we, we ended up looking at all the different options. We did talk to Albertsons. See, you know, they were very interested in merging with us. They weren't public at that point and they wanted us to um, do a deal with them, but that wasn't a good fit chemistry wise. And, uh, we talked to Warren Buffett. Maybe he would he would be interested in acquiring us. And he, he with his good sense of humor, he said, "Yeah, I own Dairy Queen. This is not a good brand fit for me." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we had no lack of people that wanted to take us private. And so um, I, I think that that's I get into some details about that in the book at, at some length. But the long and the short of it is is that. Whole Foods Market needed to. We need to drop. We need to drop our prices, and we weren't going to. We couldn't do that anymore, because if if you make a price reduction, the first thing that's going to happen is your your sales are going to go down because you're some you're selling something for a dollar now you're selling it for ninety cents. Well, your sales are going to go down. Your same store sales are going to go down, and your profits are going to go down. In the in the intermediate to longer term, you'll get increased traffic and increased sales, and and that's that's. But you needed time to be able to carry out that strategy, and we no longer had that time. So we weren't sure what to do, and we hired a. We didn't hire Goldman Sachs because I thought they were conflicted, since they also represent uh, activist companies. They, they 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 play both sides of the right. team. We hired a company called Encore, which strictly does defense, and um, they we began to put defensive moves. And one is we replaced the director, several of our directors who, who weren't practicing good governance procedures because a lot of our direct, once you got on our board, you never wanted to leave it because we had such a good culture. So we had direct, we had directors that had been on the board board for 15, 20, 25 years. And uh, so we had to get rid of them. And we brought new directors in that were, you know, very well known, like Ron Shake at Panera Bread and, and uh, Joe Mansueto, who's, who's founded Morningstar. And so we, we bolstered our board and we began to take measures to defend ourselves that we were going to fight. But I wasn't sure we were going to be able to win if we fought or if we'd be able to win in the long run. So we continued to think about what other possibilities there might be. And then one day I woke up and in my bed, it just it flashed into my mind. It was like, what about Amazon? Would Amazon be interested? And I had met I'd met uh, Jeff Bezos a year before at a Microsoft CEO um, a summit. And uh, I really liked the guy. We hit it off. We did a panel together. He asked me a ton of questions about Whole Foods, said we need to get together in the future and talk. And, uh, and uh, but, so that was about a year before. And so uh, we followed up with Amazon to see if they would be interested in Myself and three of my senior executives flew out and met with Jeff and three of his senior executives on a Sunday in a, in a Jeff's boathouse, which is next to his mansion on Lake, Lake Washington. And it's kind of a good story because the amount of security we had to go through to just get into that meeting was something. They wouldn't tell us the location until our plane had landed. 
And, um, and then we were all searched. Our car was searched. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was quite the thing. And, but we had an amazing meeting. It was like, um, I, I compare it to when you fall in love with somebody, uh, you have what I call the conversation yeah, where you just have kind of the meeting of the souls. And we talked for about between two and three hours on that first meeting. And we talked about all the things we could do together. And, and, uh, I was impressed with the leaders, the Amazon, all the Amazon guys, you know, Jeff and the other three that were there were all really super smart guys. They weren't, they weren't big corporate guys either. I mean, not the way I think of corporate guys. They, they were, they were very down to earth, very, um, good listeners and also lots of good ideas. So, um, I remember when the whole foods team gathered after the meeting, we went to a place to get some lunch and we were looking around and, and uh, we're talking about how great they were and how much we liked each one. We talked about each person. And then, and then it was like, I looked up and I said, do you think they liked us too? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out they did because we got a call back just a couple of days later. And, and literally six weeks after we had that first meeting, we had signed a merger agreement and made an announcement to the world. Mm. So it's a whirlwind romance in six weeks. And um, I just thought Amazon was going to be a, a great solution for Whole Foods. It, it, uh, I'll always wonder what would have happened if we'd fought. There's part of me that will always regret not going down that path mm -hmm. and fighting for our independence. But Amazon was going to enable us to drop prices, which is really what we needed to do. And we had four price cuts with Amazon in the first two years. They were willing to be patient and take the long term. And they also had the technology capabilities we didn't have. We've, you know, um, from, if you look at our stores now, the delivery, the whole delivery piece during COVID, we, we could have worked with Instacart, but Amazon was a much better solution for us um, than Instacart was. And they did the just walk out technology where people in two of our stores where we, you know, people don't have to, um, they don't have to check out. They just come into the store and take whatever they want and leave and the cameras and it shows up on your iPhone. Um, we just thought that um, this was going to be a fantastic partnership. And in many ways it has been a good partnership, but in other ways it hasn't been. And I'm not going to do that yeah. on the podcast but I do talk a little bit about it in the book, some of the downsides. What led you to step down in 2022 as CEO? Was it was it just part of the process of you know when you when the company gets acquired, you have to stick around for a bit, and then but you're on your way out, or not really? There is a story. There is a story there, but I'm not going to tell you the story. Okay. So you have to read my book yeah. for that one. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to announce that prematurely. But um, uh, let's just say that. Um, there was a triggering event, but it was building up. It was I and I, but also I had signed a deal to stay for five years, mm -hmm. and that five years was coming up. And uh, um, but there were there were some frustrations on my part. Okay, but that's what I'll. So say the book will book. come out. But uh, in general, yeah. May May of twenty twenty four. So you and Jeff leave together. Pretty much. New grocery store coming soon. <laughs> I do have a non-compete agreement with Amazon. So yeah, I just have one last question before we wrap up. Um, I noticed in your Instagram and Twitter slash X bio, um, you say that you're a perpetual optimist and I'm always interested in optimism um, and its power uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship and business. What would you say about how much of a role that's played in your life and your career and and how it could play a role in others who are sort of embarking on a similar journey. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I am a, I am, I am an incredible optimist and I, I think part of that's temperamental. Um, and, but I also think there's the evidence, there's compelling evidence to be optimistic. I mean, humanity is, is made so much progress in the last couple of hundred years. We're so much better off than we were by every objective standard. And, I don't understand the pessimist. I, I oftentimes put a challenge to people when I'm speaking publicly and the challenge goes, you just try this yourself sometime. I ask people, I said, look, I'll give you the entire history of the human race. Tell me another time you'd rather live than right now. It's better than right now. We've never been this good for, uh, for humanity. It's just so much better than it's ever been before. And it's not perfect. It's not utopia. Their challenges, yeah, 
So there are always challenges. That's what that's what you have young people to solve the problems that their parents couldn't solve, and but and create new problems for the next generation to solve. Well, it's true. It's exactly humanity is always going to have problems, but the idea that we're not making progress is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, if, if you go back and look at the statistics of 220 years ago, the you know what the on in today's dollars. 94% of the people alive on the planet Earth made less than $2 a day. 80, and 85% made less than $1 a day. It's 220 years ago. Illiteracy rates were 90%. Only 10% of the population could read. The average lifespan was 30. Mm. There was no antibiotics. People were, starvation was always a, a, a problem. There was ignorance. And it's really living capitalism and science that have lifted humanity out of the dirt. And so now the, the people that live on less than $2 a day is down to about 7%. That's 7% too high, but it's a heck of a lot better than the 94%. Yeah. And illiteracy rates, now only 10% of the world can't read, not 90%. And the lifespan's gone from 30 to about 78 across the planet. So, And I could go statistic after statistic yeah. after statistic. Steven Pinker's book, yeah. Enlightenment Now. I mean, I, I do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm very optimistic, guys. Yeah, I love it. And um, um, I, the world's I, getting better. I agree. I agree. And I wish we could sit here and chat all day. This has been such a fun conversation with you, John. And we appreciate you joining us and, and sharing your you know story, your wisdom. Um, and we're excited to see you know uh, what comes next for you. I know you're working on um, new, new businesses now and, and the book coming out um, next year. So it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate the time with you as well. I wish you the very best with your podcast. Thank you, John. <laughs>